Okay. No, apparently we Did that finish playing? I think we got there. Okay. There we go. Um, morning, everybody. How are you? Um, okay, let's get started. I'm here to talk to you about creativity. It's my belief, as you'll hear in this next 40 minutes, that we've had plenty of maths, we've had plenty of time to let the maths department organize all the targeting and organize all the optimization and make things as cheap as humanly possible, although it turns out they're just as expensive as they used to be in media. But we haven't solved the problem uh, that we really all are dealing with as market owners on a regular basis, which is it's very, very difficult to build a relationship with people on a six-inch screen. And um, the problem cannot be solved in the current way we're dealing with it. So all of you are more than familiar with the fact that we actually think this is advertising. That on a screen, even on a screen this large, I'm not sure you can tell what that banner's all about. And certainly on the one on your phone, you're not going to pay any attention to it. We've got these magical ads. This actually is an example where I was reading some of the uplifting political news of the day and got this fabulous pop-up to remind me to visit Orlando. And I was in Orlando. So it was really effective. Um, we also recut our TV ads and assume that people want to see them while waiting to see the actual video they want to see of someone being dragged off an aircraft or whatever it is we're really watching. And of course, it's not very difficult to look away from a six inch screen. So those aren't very effective in my opinion. And although these probably are the best we have, I've shown this presentation several times and I'm still not sure where the ad is as I scroll past it. Um, which is also why you can see the mathematical reality of these things. They get extremely low engagement rates. In fact, direct mail, Junk mail, as it's so friendly called, gets a higher response rate. And if you respond to junk mail, by the way, that is a physical response. You are very interested. So accidentally clicking on one of those ads we've just shown you is not quite the same level of commitment. And of course, I'm sure almost all of you are engaging in lots of this, um, as well you probably should, given how poor most of the things you get served as advertising are. So in our case, we believe that the future is fairly simple. You have to do better creative work. Uh, and then you can use all the smart targeting you like to reach people. And if you do those things together really well, you actually get way, way better performance. It's not rocket science. Um, I think we've gone through the rocket science phase, is my point. Um, nobody needs to be able to target any more than you can already target. We can target really, really well already. Thank you very much to all the people who built platforms. But none of those platforms currently are doing a particularly good job of encouraging greater creative. There's a good reason. Uh, they built platforms because they don't like the mess of human beings. They like not to have to talk to those human beings. We, however, can't avoid creativity, in my opinion, because today the ability exists to create the message you'd like and deliver it to who you like. So we have to go back to focusing on the creativity and the message itself, and to some degree the format. Um, which for anyone not watching television means a smaller screen. Mostly six inch screen, perhaps an eight inch screen, not much beyond that that is particularly material. So one of the areas we focused on over the last five or six years, for those of you who know anything about Husay, is working with talent. Why? Well, simply to be able to cut through the clutter and create better creative work. So we'll talk a little bit about working with talent because it's a hot topic and there's a lot of nonsense out there about how it really works. Um, we've been doing this a long time. So you'll hear two kind of attributes to talent that we focus on. One is the numbers. So yes, there is a certain amount of mathematical affinity you can look at between a person and a brand you're working with. That obviously is the reach and engagement that person generates naturally with the content they generate that isn't sponsored. And then there's the fact that you might have a budget and that budget might not fit every level of talent that you're looking at. But then perhaps even more important, and I would say increasingly more important, are what we call the qualitative att attributes, which is, does the person show up and do as you ask? Will they contribute to the creative storytelling? And are they going to be someone that can work with a brand and you can depend on them to stay safe beyond the campaign itself? So when you look at those factors, and again, the bottom part is probably more important today than ever, what you end up with is some basic headlines about working with the best talent in all spheres. And this applies from all the way in Hollywood to everything in social. 
You really most importantly want talent that are creative and professional, but most importantly, fit the idea. So it does not matter who you work with in talent. It does not matter how many subscribers or followers or movie ticket sales they've driven. If the idea is no good, no talent can make a bad idea good. We put out plenty of movies these days with major stars that end up being bombs because by Friday afternoon, everyone on the internet has reviewed it and you're now well aware that it's not very good. So we have the same problem in marketing. People cannot be fooled as easily as they used to be and we can't be lazy about it. And reach and scale is not the only thing we can worry about anymore. So with talent, the rules are the same. The other truth is, in our experience, which is pretty vast across all spectrum of talent, micro-influencers to icons and everything in between, you really find, as usual, that there's a 10% grouping that really do show up and contribute and add creatively to the brief and to the idea. And that makes everyone's life easier if you can select the right people. This is probably the area that's most infuriating when you're dealing with this stuff and the information that's out there. Um, mathematically, the level of reach, you all know this, I'm sure, on social in particular, is essentially a fraction of the total reach of your fans. So when we're running a campaign, we have to explain that if all you want to reach are the fans of the person you have engaged to participate in the campaign, you are going to reach somewhere between two and maybe at best 20% of those folks. And more importantly, those people may not be the only people you want to reach. And that's just a flat out mathematical fact. So um, when you're thinking, therefore, about who to work with, really what matters is, does the idea combined with the talent and the creative speak to the audience you're trying to reach for your brand, not speak to their fans? And again, when you combine the mathematical reality with the creative reality, that's how you end up with an optimized campaign, a good idea, the right talent, and then smartly distributed using both organic reach and paid reach to exactly who it is you'd like to speak to. And of course, the beauty of that, we'll thank the maths department, is that you can then optimize that distribution by seeing that the people with green hair perform better than the people with blue hair or whoever it is you're trying to target. So if you do that a lot, and we've done it now more than that, um, you do get all the performance improvements that you like. So you get much, much higher engagement because you've created something that cuts through the clutter. You create much higher relevance because you're optimizing your distribution of a good message to the right people. And all the other things that people like to measure, like recall and sentiment, are also significantly improved. So you can actually simply see the comments on the ads that say things like, wow, if all ads were like this, I wouldn't block as many of them. And you're like, oh, well, that's the kind of response you're looking for. So I think we all, as an industry, have to collectively accept that there's a lot of work to be done to invest in creativity. And one of the ways to do that is to work with the right kinds of creative talent. So to that end, we're going to bring up, in just a second after you've taken a look at uh, a little bit of the work, Charlie Todd from Improv Everywhere. And we'll take a look at some of the work they do before we get Charlie up here. Well, welcome everybody to the annual. Oh, maybe not. Let's try again. Sorry, Charlie. Well, welcome everybody to the annual. All right, Charlie, we're not going to get lucky with you. Let's see if we can get better. Charlie, come on out here. I'm sorry, your video appears not to want to play. My, my fault, I'm sure. It's okay. I'll just describe it off. For yeah, do it. Run it. Good to see you. Come on up. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's see if we get lucky with Matthew. Um, so we'll bring up Matthew if his video plays, and if not, we'll bring him up anyway. For years, I've made a name for myself analyzing video games, movies, and TV using real world science and math. There's always a panel where someone's like, content is king, content is king, content is king. It's the catchphrase of YouTube. But what truly matters and what truly brings people back for more is personality and having a connection with an audience and not being afraid to be your genuine self. 22 million subscribers across all social platforms. But regardless of whether you're a small influencer or a big influencer, you have to be a role model. That I'm going to help shape the future of the internet and where this cultural ecosystem takes us, I want it to be a positive future. Uh, and by the way, proof of the fact that when Matt comes out, You've got the example of come on, come on, anyway. That that <laughs> if, you, if you'd have come up, if you'd have come up with the idea, yeah, say that, if you'd have come up with the idea five, seven, eight, ten years ago of building a company where 
the idea you pitched was people would watch other people talking or playing video games, and that, that company would then sell for a billion dollars to Amazon, they would have thrown you out of the room. So a lot of stuff has changed. Anyway, thanks guys for coming on out. Thanks for having us. Okay, uh, let's talk about creativity. I'm gonna get my questions out for you. Um, so you've heard my spiel here, my intro to this stuff, which is a strong belief that we are, we're making a comeback with creativity. I think it's essential in everything we do now. You guys have proven its effectiveness over your commitment and years to do it. But you've also worked with brands. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk a little bit about that from your perspective. Like when you are asked to work with brands, because you've really built your own voice as a programmer, mm -hmm. um, what is it that you care about? What do you look for? What matters to you? Mm -hmm. Matt, why don't you start? Uh, so I mean, obviously, you, you kind of mentioned it on your side. But for us, it's the same thing where, first and foremost, does the brand fit with you know, what we're looking to do, uh, the type of thing that would interest our audience? Uh, so that's, that's obviously question number one. Is this an organic push for us or is this kind of a reach? Like would our audience believe this to be a product or service that we would organically use on our own? Right. Um, as we're kind of working with the brand and looking at the creative brief uh, or pitching out creative on our own, it's always what is the added value to the fan about incorporating that brand? So, you know, the audience expects a certain level of content from us every single week. What is that brand integration going to allow us to do that is additive to the fan? Is it you know higher production value, doing something that's kind of wish fulfillment for the channel, uh, doing something that is going to allow them a cool experience or cool video that they wouldn't have seen otherwise across the platform? Because um, then all of a sudden it goes from I'm watching you know an ad to I'm watching something that is actually targeted at me, my interests, and something that I'm gonna get excited about, and I have a very positive association with the brand because it was a part of that video and allowed one of my favorite creators to do something that they wouldn't have gotten to do otherwise. Right. Um, and then the last one is, does the brand have clear KPIs? Uh, and this is, I think, one of the biggest things that brands across the board could work on yes. is in the initial meetings when we're talking to these brands, we ask, what are the metrics of success for this campaign? What are your goals with this video? And I kid you not, like 90% of the time, those haven't been figured out in advance. You know, at best, they're like, oh, we want it to get a lot of views. You know, but that's, that is so surface level at this point on these platforms, and views can be purchased very easily. Yes. It's, are you driving conversions? Is it engagement? If it's engagement, what sort of engagement is it? Are you creating a longer campaign? Things like that. So I think, you know, those three things are really kind of the differentiator of, you know, whether we say yes to a brand integration or no. That's perfectly put. I think um, in our case, as you say, we've really been making standalone ad creative. Mm -hmm. uh, for you guys, you've got to weave this stuff into your, to your point, right. which you've eloquently put together there, into the story and the audience you already tell. You talk about personality in the intro video. Mm -hmm. We didn't get Charlie's video up, I'm afraid, Charlie. But um, comedy is even harder. Um, weaving brand stories into comedy. Tell us a little bit about your take on that. Yeah, I, I agree a lot with uh, what Matthew said. And actually, I think our names are backwards on the chart there, just in case anybody's confused. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you're right. You're absolutely right. A little prank. Um, but no, so with you know, I, a lot of the, the same stuff with Improv Everywhere, where uh, when a brand comes to us and they, they like the stunts we've done, they've seen our big public stunts and our, our surprise and delight moments that we create in public spaces, and they say, we want to do something similar to that. Um, in order for our audience to really be totally on board with it, it has to go above and beyond what we normally do. Um, and I love uh, the, the projects that are most successful when the brands come to me and say, we like what you do. We want to help you do what you do. Here's our campaign. How can we work together? How can you bring you know, what we're trying to get out in the world to what you do? So for example, uh, a few years ago, ESPN came to me and said, we have the British Open, the golf tournament. Uh, we're looking to promote that and raise awareness for that. We have the Claret Jug, which is the trophy that is given to the winner of the British Open. And it's touring, and it's coming to New York City. Can we give you this you know, priceless 100-year-old jug and have you do something with it? And those are the emails that I love. It's like, yes, that's amazing. That's like a once-in-a-lifetime thing to get to be able to put into your YouTube video. Uh, and our fans will clearly understand you know, why we said yes to that. 
Um, so we did a project on Pier 25 down in Tribeca. There's a mini golf course, and we surprised families playing mini golf by turning it into a professional golf tournament. So people are just you know putting on the 18th hole, and all of a sudden ESPN newscasters show up. And we and we we wanted that integration because it made it better to have mm -hmm. actual ESPN newscasters there. Uh, we had a gallery of 100 people show up, and then the winner, a you know 10 year old boy, is given this giant you know mm -hmm. priceless historic trophy to hold up. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of things where someone comes to me and says. Hey, we have this cool asset, or you know, or even even if it's just budget, even if it's just like what would you what would you want what do you want to do and this to play off the theme of our campaign, you know, with yeah. more resources than you normally have. I mean, essentially, it's just a great idea, <laughs> right? I mean, it starts with a good idea and then the capabilities of executing it professionally, like you guys have. But the idea is is so key. And to your point, I think um, in the media industry traditionally, of course, it was all about inventory. And, frankly, still remains significantly about inventory. But today, if you're trying to reach people and speak to them and build a relationship, ideas, events, mm -hmm. things that include people are significantly more important in building a new relationship. And this is hard mm -hmm. if you're trying to sell more deodorant or toothpaste or things that are difficult and, and not necessarily easy to weave into good ideas. Mm -hmm. Um, historically or organically. It's true. It, it is interesting though, and I think one thing that brands often underestimate in this space is the importance of creativity, not just in the video itself, but also in the packaging around that video. You could have the Citizen Kane of YouTube or you know Facebook or what have you, but if it's not packaged well with a, a really quality thumbnail and title thought out well in advance, that video is going to underperform regardless. You need people to be enticed enough to click on that piece of content to really see the, the quality creative that has gone on inside of it. And I think that's another area where a lot of brands tend to fall down is they don't think about what is the packaging around it or even working with publishers, you know, they don't think about like, wait, people need to actually opt into this piece of content before they really see the, the quality creative that we built into it. Yes, it's almost a format issue, yeah. right? It's like you wouldn't ever imagine serving a 10 minute ad in between in commercial breaks on TV mm -hmm. because we established a format over decades and that seemed to stabilize. We're still in the process, I think, of establishing the formats that are most effective. Mm -hmm. I think, and I think it's important that the, if you're doing something that's sponsored on your channel, that it follows the same format, the same script that you would normally have. Um, I worked with a brand within the past year where they were really insistent. It was for, uh, for a movie, um, a pr promotion for a, a Hollywood movie. And they were really insistent on the movie being mentioned in like the first five seconds. Right. Like the host <laughs> of the video right away say, tonight this is brought to you by this movie. Um, and that's not something that we normally do in our channel. And I fought them on it. I said, that's a bad idea. We shouldn't do that. The video, the movie's already very clearly integrated. We thank the film at the end for supporting. Right. Um, and they really fought me on it. And the video underperformed. Yeah, I mean, it goes to the, my next sort of question is, uh, getting a, a brand to trust you. They come to you mm -hmm. for this very reason is the thought, right? They see your reach, they see your performance, they see your fan base, they see your engagement. Then they come to you for these ideas, but they then frequently want to impact those ideas negatively with what you would call traditional format <coughs> marketing. So how have you gotten to the point where, and I'm sure you both have multiple stories, to the point where you've got either repeat customers or trust with those folks, that you've gotten through that first case where you were like, listen, I told you this wouldn't work, see, it didn't. Now if we do it my way, it will, and they're at the point where they trust you. Mm -hmm. I mean, Matt, have you got to the point? Uh, for us, a lot of it come, boils down to our experience on the platform and our ability to deliver results, right? So outside of just you know, having a, a really unique format on the platform, we're also very invested in the analytics behind the scenes, and we're constantly running tests on the platform to see how the neural networks of the various social media networks are distributing content, you know, how things are populating in suggested video feeds, how audiences are engaging with content, and seeing how to better optimize that. And one of the things that we we're able to deliver to brands is a promise of, you know, we've run tests on everything from the color of annotation at the end of your video to the number of arrows in the description pointing to the link to sign up. And I can tell you, you know, which of, what colors are most effective, how many arrows, how long the piece of content is, things like that. And all of those small little changes seem insignificant, but you know, it adds up percentage points so I can design you an end card that gets you a 0% click-through rate or a 45% click-through rate. It, it's that substantial of a right. difference. Right. And being able to approach you know, a brand integration with that level of, of knowledge 
in a space where you know these platforms are changing every day, mm -hmm. the audience behavior is changing every day, and it's hard for a lot of brands or publishers to kind of keep up with that cadence and keep up with those trends. And so I'm able to approach those creative meetings, those optimization meetings, whatever, uh, with with that level of knowledge to say, you know, yes, you have your brand message points that you want to get across. I, as someone who's been studying this space and knows the internet, can can translate those message points into something that's going to you know be even more effective because of our collaborative nature on this project. Yeah, I mean, you, it's a, a great, again, a great example of idea, talent, format, mm -hmm. and smart distribution. You have to do them all. You can't just pick one of them. Uh, Charlie, anything you want to add? Yeah, I've had, the same, I've had a lot of experiences where distribution's not even thought of. You know, it's just, well, you, you know, you have a YouTube channel, you've got two million subscribers, so we're going to work with you, and that's, that's the end of it, you know? Yeah. And I always push to have that call, like who, because generally the people who are engaging me are not in the, mm -hmm. you know, the PR side or the distribution side of the, of the brand. Uh, so I push to have that call, like let's talk about what, what the plan is. And I think what you said earlier, Steve, is right. I mean, you can't, you can't count on just throwing a video on an influencer's platform and, and that being it. Um, you know, the, the algorithms at YouTube and particularly at Facebook are, are rigged in a way now that you have to pay them. Yes. Um, and, you know, I, I took me a long, many years to get over that because <laughs> I felt like, from you know, Facebook conned me into sending all my fans to, to their site and then asked me to pay for it. Yeah. Um, but that's what they did and that's the reality. And if you want to reach those people, you know, you have to have a, a, you know, a pay yeah, you know, part of your strategy. Absolutely. I mean, and we, you may know we were acquired by Viacom, we were subscribed by Viacom at the beginning of the year. And, and we are, and a part of the reason for that deal, a large part of the reason for that deal was being able to effectively serve brands with multiple distribution options, all of which are optimized for the format you right. want. Because if you do come up with a good idea, if you do work with towns, or if you do work with IP, and you're using those things to amplify the work you're doing, you still need all the smarts you've discussed right. to make sure it optimized performance-wise on all the different places. That always involves paying <laughs> if you're dealing with social platforms, because to your point, that is the business they're in. But there's still a smart way of doing it. Um, and it feels like we're still in the very early stages of people realizing that there are smarter ways of spending your money without just buying the standard three second view or throwing the usual recut stuff out there. It's still really, really a small percentage of the work being done that's being done effectively on those yeah, platforms. Actually, actually, I loved what you said during the, the first part of your presentation about how it's so commonplace for people to just recut their television trailers for these you know, short skip skippable ad units because to, to your point, like a lot of these brands aren't considering that these different social platforms have very different ecosystems and very different types of content that works on them. You know, a, an Instagram video is going to underperform if it's heavily edited and feels organic, whereas that is the, the order of the day for Vine videos back in the day. Uh, a Twitter video, you know, has to be under a minute if it has even a hope of a chance of performing. Yes. Um, you know, and then obviously YouTube is more accustomed to longer form content and Facebook's optimized for that, the scroll strategy. And it's so tempting for brands to come in and just have this blanket idea of one creative fits all platforms and let's just roll it out across the board. But you really have to be smart enough with how you're tuning the calls to action, the cadence of the video, the, even the editing style and, and you know, the, the, cre the jokes and lingo that's used in those, in those videos uh, to, to really match the platform that's being distributed on. Right, and to, to your other point, I mean, I won't tell the exact story, but um, you know, I did uh, one of my favorite stories about your point about testing everything. When nobody really knows anything. Right. You know, when it comes down to it, you have to test everything. Is a large social platform story I heard where they changed a single word mm -hmm. in the sign-on process and increased the virality of the sharing of the sign-on by five times. Yep. You know, and no one would have guessed it, no one would have thought it. There's no meeting you could have taken where someone would have had that idea. Like, oh, you just had to try it, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it changed the process significantly. A lot of talk right now, we should bring it up anyway, just, uh, just to get your opinion on it. A lot of talk about um, trust with creators in general, buying followers, robots. Uh, I can give you my opinion after the fact, but tell me what you guys think about that. Have you ever yourselves been tempted in the early stages in building these, uh, these follow accounts? Uh, what do you think of this whole space where people actually buy fake humans to follow them in order to engage the process? I, th I mean, to me, I've, I've never done it, but I will say that it's one of those things where it's going to be counterproductive to your goal, right? Because at the end of the day, I think 
one, one area where we have seen this industry move forward is people are becoming savvier that large numbers don't equate success. You know, there's plenty of large multi-million subscriber YouTube channels that don't get more than 100,000 views on a, on a particular video. The engagement percentage is actually low. And I think what you're doing by buying these followers, buying these bots, what have you, most of them are just gonna be counterproductive to your goal because you're gonna have a large, empty, meaningless number that isn't actually yielding you long-term results. Yeah. And in fact, May, we, we've started to kind of look into this on, on our consulting side of things, but may actually be detrimental because now all of a sudden, if you've bought a bunch of Russian bots, your audience, like the neural network is trained, oh, Russian audiences may be more primed to watch this content. <laughs> right. And <laughs> if it's in Russian English, Russian robots then are your number one customer. Yeah. Exactly, and so you're just kind of like, basically shooting yourself in the foot in the earliest days of your campaign. Like, nothing can yeah. truly be just slow, organic success, you know, aided in part by smart targeting and things like that yes. across these platforms. Yeah, yes. it's definitely not a long-term strategy. No. I mean, you can, you can fool a brand once with a big number like that, but, yeah. you know, I, I think brands are savvy and they look at the engagement numbers and they And, and it's building a relationship, right? I mean, again, it, first of all, it's very hard to be funny. Uh, and so I, I particularly, you know, empathize with your, your uh, work. And then the consistency we talked about coming up, like, there is no quick way anymore. You know, the early days are over. Early days uh, at Facebook, Guns N' Roses had 60 million people following them. There's just no way all those people are alive. You know, just, I mean, and that's not a robot question. That's just probably some of them have aged out of being alive. Um, but uh, to your point, early days, you could make these huge moves when Facebook allowed 120% reach. Now you really gotta be consistently committed, especially I think on, on a platform like YouTube where the, the audience has gotten used to the fact that folks like yourselves are making consistent programming like content of a quality and a relationship that you're building with them. It's a relationship driven issue, right? How about for who say? Uh, what defines kind of a trusted creator or you know, trusted influencers in your experience? Well, it's a very good question. And as a result, we have an excellent talent team who've been with us from the beginning, who basically build this over the course of hundreds of campaigns, build this level of trust and understanding of the kinds of people who show up. Because again, in our case, we are very specifically usually coming up with ideas with the talent yeah. and creating really ad creative. Mm -hmm. And so it really is a very professional process, even if it looks like it's talent short or handheld, yeah. you know. And they really have generated a list of, you know, of their own 10, 15, 20,000 folks across every level of talent on every platform where, you know, these folks show up. They do as you ask, they collaborate with the brand, they tell the truth to the brand too, they're not afraid, they won't just acquiesce to your point about doing silly things and we try and help there too. So it's, it, to, to pretend it's a science, it's just not. You can do a certain amount mathematically as I mentioned, but a huge portion and perhaps increasingly so, and I suspect this will get worse in terms of how the social platforms in particular start to limit organic reach, going to your point. Um, it, the human part of it is going to be more and more important than ever. And you know what? It's time. It's time that the human part of it got more important everywhere. Um, I think, slight sidebar, I think the, the, you know, the Netflix and the Amazon approach into television has improved significantly the quality of the work we're putting out as television producers. And all of those things have to come now, I think, into the, into the brand and creative process. So that's certainly that's how we've had to do it. Um, we didn't get to see everything, but I'd love to hear just one, if you don't mind, um, without, if you don't want to call out the specific brand, but uh, tell me a story, Charlie, you start, tell me a story of something you've done where you were particularly proud of the outcome and, and, and how, it went, how it worked, and then how you measured the success of that for the brand. Yeah, I, I'm most proud of the projects um, where I've worked with the brand more than once. Um, and I think it, I, I did a pro couple, two projects with Target um, recently where they approached me and said, hey, we have a holiday campaign. Um, we want to do something with you. We like your we like your videos. We like this whole notion of surprise and delight that you're known for. Um, and and then the question was, what do you want to do? What would what, what's a big holiday thing that would be great for your channel that you want to do that we can power? And I thought about it and I said, well, I've always wanted to go Christmas caroling with an orchestra and have you know knock on someone's door, open the door, and there's a full orchestra on someone's front lawn. And they said, we love it. Uh, we've got the song Marshmallow World is in our 30 second spot that we're running for Christmas. We have the, we have the rights to that song. Could that be one of the songs that, that the orchestra plays. And I said, yeah, that's great. Um, and, uh, and we did it, and it was, it was a big success. The next year, they came back to me and said, holiday's coming up again. What do you want to do? Um, and I said, OK, well, I've always wanted to put a giant light switch in front of a city park. So we built this seven-foot-tall light switch. 
and had random New Yorkers could flip it on and every light in the entire park, every, every tree was covered with Christmas lights would turn on at the same time. Yeah. And they, we cut two versions of that actually. This, this is a, kind of an interesting case where for our channel, that was really it. And at the end it was, you know, thanks so much to Target for again this year sponsoring our holiday video. Um, and you know, the comments were universally positive right. about that. Um, and we also cut a version that was for Target's Facebook where they had the Target dog show up and make a cameo and make an appearance in the video. And I'd like, I felt that having you know, their dog trot into an Improv Everywhere video sort of randomly and without context wasn't the right fit. They agreed, so we made two versions of it, and they both did really well. Um, right. So to, to me, like, I mean, I, I know I had the luxury of having done this for 10 years and having been on YouTube for 10 years and having a reputation, but no matter what level the creator is, it's, it's so nice to feel respected and to feel, hey, we like what you do. We want to support you doing what, what you do great. Um, here's what our campaign is, here's our campaign themes, here's what we're looking to achieve, how can we marry those things and create a win-win situation. Matt, something you'd like to tell us about? Uh, for us, we, we did a partnership with uh, Ubisoft, actually, uh, for one of their games, uh, Rainbow Six Siege, uh, where way back in episode 14 of the show, this is six years ago, uh, I had made an offhand comment of, if, this, if I had the budget of Mythbusters, I would hop into a plane right now and test out you know, the, the physics of the barrel, you know, plane flips and stunts in real life. Um, but I don't, so you're stuck with these crappy images. Uh, <laughs> fast forward you know, six years later, and you know, we're at a size and scale where we're able to work with a company like Ubisoft on, on this upcoming game where they give us, you know, they're like, here's the budget, what do you want to do with it? And I'm like, I want to actually test out the, the elements of this game in real life. And it's a game where you fill the shoes of like a SWAT team member on kind of like raiding a building. And so we actually partnered with uh, the LA SWAT team. We uh, met with bomb experts. We did a day of training. I got myself and a couple other uh, top YouTube gamers in. And we were able to kind of train the for a day with them. We did a simulated hostage situation. We all fell apart. It was a complete mess. <laughs> um, but but it was one of the one of the most liked videos and highest engagement videos that we've ever had on the channel. Right. And I, some of my favorite comments were, "I know I'm watching an ad, but I love this and I want more." Right. And it actually became more uh, because that served as a pilot episode for what eventually became our YouTube Red series, Game Lab, uh, where then YouTube was like, "Wow, this was such a positive experience. It was so you know the brand loved it. This was such a good." You know, the, the viewership was really strong. Let's make this into a fully fledged series, which, which we were able to do in partnership with YouTube Red. And that in turn allowed us to uh, create like 360 video experiences to partner every single one. So it allowed us to continue to experiment with new formats, try new ways of engaging with, the, uh, the, with storytelling. And again, what is the additive value to the fan? We're uh, now placing them in the world of these video games that they wouldn't have gotten to otherwise. Yeah, it's so. just a great idea. I mean, it's just, you know, uh, you mentioned brand measurement, by the way, and how you're frequently surprised that they're not sure what they want to measure. Um, tell me a little bit about what you guys like to measure personally, and then what you would recommend in your campaigns would be what a brand should think about measuring when they work with you. Mm -hmm. Beyond views, I mean. Yeah, views. I mean, yeah. I think you know, views are, are are so fickle with the changing algorithms on YouTube, Facebook, and other platforms. Um, and yeah, it's all about engagement. To to me, you know, I particularly in the first day of a release, I'm reading all the comments. I'm seeing what my fans like and, and what they respond to. Um, we have a big email newsletter, and a lot of people, you know, write me that way. So I think just listening to what your fans are saying is is important. Right. Uh, for us, the the metrics that we really care about are. Um, Obviously, watch time is, is huge across any of these right. platforms, regardless. Uh, on Facebook, it's dwell time. On YouTube, it's watch time. Um, subscriber conversion uh, per 1,000 views. So this is something that uh, is, doesn't exist in analytics, uh, but is super powerful, where what we'll do is we'll parse, parse out our content based on genre or like type of game that we're covering, type of episode, science episode versus lore episode. And uh, we'll actually normalize the data. So it's like, how many subscribers did this get per 1,000 views? And in turn, that enables us to tell us which of the types of content on the channel are allowing us to grow at the fastest rate or getting the most people to convert over to subscribers and be loyal followers uh, versus which are the ones that are kind of maintaining versus which are the underperformers. Um, that in turn allows us to kind of hone our programming strategy accordingly and, and kind of up, go into brand relationships being able to say like, hey, we know that when we do meta or industry theories, those are some of our uh, top converting videos. Mm -hmm you know, games that touch on like indie horror and have a deep lore component, those are other big wins. 
but if you if you want to really integrate into kind of this more mainstream title that you might be more comfortable with or whatever, just know that it might not perform as strongly. Right. Uh, so that's yeah, subs per thousand views is actually one of the most powerful metrics that doesn't exist anywhere. Yeah, that's but very it's, clever. It's I mean, it it goes back to your point about being natively digital, and you're thinking about customer acquisition. Yeah. You know, when they they leaked that Amazon uh, info a couple of months right. ago about how they were using Amazon Prime Video mm -hmm. and how they were saying, you know, if you signed up and the first show you watched <laughs> after you signed up for Prime was whatever it was, they credited that show with having acquired you for Prime and got a cost per acquisition basically based on how much they spent to make the show. Yeah. You know, this kind of mindset is strangely still only in the minds of, you know, the Valley focused and DR driven product businesses when really it's the business we're all in. Mm -hmm. You know, you simply can't avoid these kinds of things. Yeah. All right, what, what metric would you recommend? Well, we've started to push, again, in Acre, like to your point, view through rate, why wouldn't you care that that be the most important metric right. alongside sentiment where you can look at the comments? Because, uh, you know, the idea that you would buy a standard Facebook view at less than three seconds, right. which usually is less than one, and consider that a view is sort of ridiculous. Uh, when, especially when you can monitor the alternatives. And one of the things we like to brag about is, is how many people we've got to watch 10 seconds of an ad, mm -hmm. um, which you, know, you can't necessarily prove in other places. One last question I'd like to ask you as we're running out of time. Um, monetization, a little sidebar, as it relates to YouTube. I want to give Google and YouTube some credit um, because they were the very first to even offer creators a piece of the action. And frankly, I'm not sure anyone else has even done it yet, really. Talked about me. it, but no one else has really done it. Um, what, what do you feel about what's going on generally at YouTube and the challenges they've had? You know, safety of content, reducing the amount of money some folks are able to earn. Uh, as professionals in the space, I suspect you guys are going to be perfectly fine with how this plays out because it probably was rewarding the kinds of folks who were doing stuff perhaps a little less yeah, acceptable. But what do you think? It's been a frustrating year, though. I mean, I've had videos that I've put up on my channel that are completely brand safe, no red flags, no, you know, no problem. I mean, almost all of my content is that way. Right. Um, and then have it get demonetized immediately, and then it switches back. And it's like, OK, well, I, lo I lost a day, but I had a video that you know, did 8 million views in a month, and I right. you know, might have maybe lost a million views in ad revenue. But it, it's also the ad revenue has gotten so low on YouTube that it's not really a big factor in, you know, in my decision making. Um, but I appreciate it, and I think it's, you know, uh, Facebook has been just months away from paying creators for, <laughs> what, five, yes. five years? Yes, I mean, it's yes. ridiculous. The fact, the fact the that they've been flirting with, we're finally going to pay people. Like, no, we're not going to pay independent creators. We're just going to give a bunch of money to big corporations to do live video for a year. And then that fails. We'll give a bunch of money to do 360 or whatever thing they're yeah. chasing. But yeah, I've been constantly hearing that they're about to pay me any day. And then what I'm actually experiencing is they're asking me to pay them to reach my own audience. Yeah. So, you know, and they also got Trump elected, so, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Follow that one, Matt. <laughs> right? And, 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 how, how can you? No, I, I, think the, I think the biggest challenge just in general is the algorithms of all these platforms are really emphasizing churn and burn content, stuff that can be produced right. cheaply and easily in long form in every every single day that gets people to come back to the platform uh, every day and that is fundamentally opposed to the type of content that that we both make and that a lot of brands want to integrate with uh, yes. they want to integrate into wow pieces they want to integrate into stuff that they're going to be comfortable sharing with their boss and that they can like you know submit to an awards you know like an ad awards and things like that and and also that deliver views but not just kind of like on on your day to day and i think that that's been the biggest struggle on the monetization front for us but at the same time, like, like you said, you know, YouTube at, at its core is a business and it has to make decisions that allow that business to continue running and, and credit where credit's due, like they have been completely, uh, like I, I definitely appreciate without them, this business wouldn't exist and the digital video ecosystem would look completely yeah. different. And so, you know, if, if the, the pressure coming in from advertisers is you have to be more brand safe, you know, you, we, we aren't comfortable on this platform, like, Really, the uh, quite honestly, like the onus should fall a little bit more on the brands and be smart about who they're targeting, where their ads are running. Mm -hmm. You know, making sure that their agencies are staying accountable to where those ads are running. They're not going to do that though. They're always going to, you know, pass the buck in a lot of cases. And so, moving it to YouTube's court, where there's more algorithmic solutions, I understand. But it's it's just such a challenging mm -hmm. problem, right? Uh, talking with product engineers there, 
you know, one of the biggest challenges they have is like, here's one of the biggest music videos on the platform. It has someone with a bag over their head, like, right. you know, hyperventilating. That's not brand safe, but it's one of the biggest music videos and everyone wants to integrate or, you know, wants right. their ads running in front of it. Where do you draw the line? And I think that's the kind of awkward middle ground that we're in right now. Hopefully it kind of smooths itself out. Hopefully we find kind of an equilibrium between where brands are, say, you know, comfortable with a little bit more extreme stuff than they were used to. But at the same time, you know, the whole ecosystem becomes a little bit safer and everyone is able to trust each other a little bit better. Well, certainly you've seen here two professional creators of the highest caliber who've committed years to becoming professionals at the space. In our case, now part of Viacom, we're committed to creating more and more premium solutions for brands everywhere they need them, and it's going to require professionals like you to be involved. And I think here in America, where the go-go growth years of acquiring users is over, it's now going to come down to this kind of creative differentiation. Um, and so these platforms are going to increasingly need us mm -hmm. and us. So our opportunity together is to be the format creators for effective advertising on these platforms, and that's what I hope we'll be able to do. So thank you both very thank much you. for joining me here. Thank, thank you, you for Steve. having us. And, uh,